This video will be a response to the Netflix series Ancient Apocalypse. I will do my absolute best to remain as fair as possible in my response to the show. So I've watched all eight episodes and read articles online from people who are supporting the show and people who are against the show. I always like to look at both sides of the coin. So I will make a video for each episode. These videos will all differ in length depending on how much I feel the need to explain. So many counter arguments and rebuttals have been written online and they are scattered everywhere, which makes it very difficult to find for those who are just coming across the works of Graham Hancock for the very first time. For people who are interested in knowing more, who like to research things themselves to, you know, fully understand it. So this video will give you all of the information in one place as I look into the show and I'll do my best to show the facts from the fiction and we go episode by episode. In these videos I will also be using quotes directly from archaeologists, historians and other people in the field that I've gathered online. I will also sometimes be using quotes from Graham Hancock himself and other people that support him. So without any further ado, my name is Kaylee and this is my video about Ancient Apocalypse Episode 1, The Great Flood. What is fact and what is fiction? Graham Hancock starts the series off with describing himself as a journalist that's investigating human prehistory because he suspects that humans are a species with amnesia. Of course, you know, being familiar with his work, this sentence is very well known and often used by him. I might personally not agree with him on this, but it is one of the things I've heard him say most often and he's most well known for this particular sentence. So he is of the opinion that we humans have forgotten a very important thing of our past, which he thinks is the existence of a lost, advanced, ancient civilization from the Ice Age. Saying the Ice Age doesn't really point it down as the last Ice Age started 100,000 years ago and ended at the end of the Younger Dryas 11,600 years ago. That's a really broad timeline to have. With this show, Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock wants to show evidence that challenges the traditional view of human history, which, if I might add my personal two cents, is always changing and developing due to new excavations, new research by the use of new technology into already uncovered things and new discoveries in the field of archaeology, anthropology and paleoanthropology. He says that his idea of an advanced civilization from the Ice Age will be upsetting the so-called experts because during the Ice Age, the only humans alive were simple hunter-gatherers. I think it's really strange to call the hunter-gatherers in Europe and Asia and Africa from the Ice Age simple, as they were definitely not primitive people. They needed intelligence and skill to survive that brutal period of time where open tundra and glaciers were covering most of Europe <laughs> and food was very scarce in such conditions, which makes survival a lot more difficult. And of course, during this time in Anatolia, we have the pre-pottery Neolithic people, who are also known as the Anatolian Neolithic farmers, who created sites like Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe and the other Tastepeller sites named Nevali Kori, San Liurfa, Yeni Mahale, Hamsan Tepe, Sefer Tepe, Tasli Tepe, Kurt Tepe, Harpetsuvan Tepe, Saiburg and Ayan Lar Hoyuk. None of these <laughs> were primitive and they were made by people with skill and knowledge. These sites are characterized by the T-shaped pillars and other parts of these sites date back to at least, at least 11,600 years ago. And then some of them are even older. And then there was the discovery of Bonkuklu Tarla in southeastern Turkey, which has been estimated to date back to around 12,000 years ago, at the very least. And this is just, the in Anatolia, this is one example, there are many more. So going back to him saying that his idea will be upsetting the so-called experts, 
I personally believe he is going straight into the role of the martyr, as he then goes to call himself enemy number one of archaeologists. He says that he is the person to show different points of view because, well, you know, the mainstream academia have an extremely defensive, arrogant and patronizing attitude, which is stopping us all from considering it to be a possibility. So if I may interject here, if there is one thing I have learned from academia, from paleontologists, archaeologists, anthropologists, paleoanthropologists and other scientists, is that they have quite the open mind when it comes to the ancient world. They like to think about the possibility. Most of them are actually very open to the idea that human history goes back further than we currently think, than we currently have been able to prove, that we could have been more advanced than we currently can prove by the evidence found so far. But the thing is, it is their job and their duty to stick to the evidence and only speak about what's factually proven. They can at times, and they do sometimes, talk about the plausibility of something bigger, grander, older, etc, etc. But besides hinting at the possibility, they will never speak of it as truth in any way, shape or form. I honestly bet that archaeologists would be absolutely elated if a discovery would prove the existence of a previously unknown civilization dating back to the last ice age. Just like how amazed they actually were when they found out that these sites in Turkey date back to the Younger Dryas. Archaeologists have never tried to hide the dates from sites like Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe, none of them, <laughs> or any of the sites on the world for that matter. I feel like Graham Hancock here is painting a very bad picture of the people doing the hard work in the field, with no comfort and you know, not much recognition. He also keeps using the word mainstream archaeologists, which implies the existence of alternative archaeologists. But I can tell you that there aren't alternative archaeologists, and that is for one very simple reason. Archaeology is carried out in a scientific manner, because otherwise it's not archaeology. Archaeology itself is a science. They use scientific methods to date things, and without that science, it cannot be proven. And the beauty of science is that it's ever-changing, it's not stagnant, which means that new techniques and methods will be developed, technological advancements will make researching things easier and more precise. We can pinpoint and narrow it down. It is actually often needed that we go back to already excavated and researched sites and take new samples and use these new methods to verify the earlier done work. But, you know, all that is fun. Back to the show, because that's what we're here for. He says that mainstream archaeologists are claiming that after the last ice age, after the Younger Dryas some 9,600 years ago, the hunter-gatherers suddenly started farming and raising livestock. Which is simply not true. We know that the pre-pottery Neolithic people in the Fertile Crescent were already domesticating plants and animals around 12,000 years ago, during the Younger Dryas. This cold spell is actually often attributed to most likely being the reason for them to start doing this. So these pre-pottery Neolithic people are also known as Anatolian Neolithic farmers and ancient Aegean farmers. So around 9,000 years ago, these Neolithic people from the Fertile Crescent started to move into Europe, and they are known as the early European farmers. These early European farmers were direct descendants from the first farmers from the Fertile Crescent, who were already farming and keeping livestock for about 3,000 years. So no, agriculture and the keeping of livestock never happened suddenly. And Honestly, in 2022, uh, I've not met an archaeologist or a historian that will claim otherwise, because this has been proven to be factually true. He then says that this sudden burst of agriculture led to the creation of the first settlements and the first cities, until the first civilization emerged 6,000 years ago. But here I am, honestly thinking that he forgot about the oldest city in the world, Jericho. 
The oldest evidence of settlement dates back to around 12,000 years ago, again in the middle of the Younger Dryas. And around 11,600 years ago, at the end of the Younger Dryas, the climate changed and the Natufians were able to inhabit the region year-round, making their settlement permanent. Yes, the city of Uruk is often seen as the birth of civilization, but that's because writing started there. That's not necessarily the first city. Jericho is the first city, dating back to 11,600 years ago. None of this was sudden, and it already started to develop during the Younger Dryas. So the one thing of truth that I have heard him say within the first five minutes of the first episode is that new discoveries keep pushing back the horizon, which in my own words, in my own thoughts, means timeline. And yes, new discoveries always keep pushing back the timeline, the current believed timeline. And yes, I absolutely agree with this wholeheartedly. And so do most archaeologists, most anthropologists, and most paleoanthropologists. As more things are discovered, uncovered, researched, and new technologies are used to verify dates that have been uncovered in the past, the timeline will always be pushed back. Older things will for certain be found. It's that we have to stick to the current believed timeline that we have been able to factually prove. Just because we haven't found the other older evidence yet doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But we have to be careful about this. That's the nature of archaeological research. Even paleontologists, anthropologists and paleoanthropologists are aware that things keep getting older. Because compared to, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 or even 60 years ago, we as a species are much more advanced nowadays and we can use our technological advancements to research the history of the planet much better than we were able to do in the past. So in the show, he then goes to talk about Gunung Padang, which he calls one of the most remarkable and controversial discoveries of our time. Gunung Padang is located in Indonesia. The site was first mentioned in 1891 by a Dutch geologist and mentioned again in 1941 by a Dutch researcher. Yes, back then Indonesia was part of the Dutch Empire. After that, it wasn't really looked into until local farmers renewed interest in the site in 1979. So Gunung Padang is a naturally formed hill, although the landscape of this hill has been adjusted by humans over time. They quarried basalt columns of cooled lava flows that were found a very short distance to the north of the hill site. And these blocks have some, you know, curious shapes, um, very hexagonal. Curious shapes like this often occurs when lava cools down. So the people created four rectangular courtyards on four terraces. And a fifth terrace was actually discovered in 1981. Excavations into the idea that the hill was an ancient burial site revealed no evidence to support that theory, and therefore it's currently believed that this hill is an early type of ancestor worship place. Just like the Mesopotamians, like the Sumerians, used to worship on top of the mountains before they started to build their first ziggurats. The higher we are, the closer we are to the sky, and therefore the closer we are to the gods. Of course, with higher, I mean in elevation, not due to substances. Although that was another way of communicating with the gods, for sure. So, you know what? Never mind. Both highs are usable here. Damn it. Get high. Either way. <laughs> but back to Gunung Padang. There are two cultural layers, according to Ali Akbar. One layer is dated to 500 BCE, and the other layer is dated to 5200 BCE. So a little over 7,000 years old. Graham Hancock then goes on to say that 7,000 years ago, the people in the area were simple hunter-gatherers. So what on earth could have motivated them to bring those blocks to this hill? I personally think that's a wrong assumption because it's not clear if the blocks were placed there 2,500 years ago or 7,200 years ago. We can't know for sure unless we date the ground underneath. The show then brings on Danny Hillman Natawi Jaja a geologist who suggests that the construction of Gunung Padang started 24,000 years ago. But 
There's a problem with this. The geological work that he's done has never been published, and 34 Indonesian scientists have actually signed a petition questioning his motives and methods. The excavations were well funded by the government, but they were rushed and they were not carried out by the proper qualified people and using the qualified proper methods, according to these Indonesian scientists. Therefore, his claims of Gunung Padang originating 24,000 years ago cannot be accepted as fact unless they reveal the research to the public and his peers. Peer review is one of the most important things when it comes to the scientific world. So what I find very difficult in watching this first episode of the show is that Graham Hancock mentions the last ice age often. But one moment he hints to the Younger Dryas, and the other moment he hints to the last glacial period. While both of these are periods during the last ice age, they are quite different. This is because the last glacial period started 100,000 years ago and ended around 25,000 years ago, while the Younger Dryas started 12,900 years ago and ended around 11,600 years ago. So between 25,000 and 12,900 years ago, the people who lived on the planet weren't sitting still as this was an interglacial period. The climate very slowly started to warm up. Not by much, but it stopped cooling down after the last glacial period occurred, known as the last glacial maximum, with its peak between 26,500 and 22,000 years ago. We know that the oldest discovered settlement ever found dates back to 25,000 years ago, at this point in time. This was a settlement consisting of huts made from mammoth bones and rock, named Dolni Vestornich in the Czech Republic. We also know of the footprints that we have discovered at White Sands in New Mexico that date back to 23,000 years ago. I would like to make it very well known that Graham Hancock is absolutely correct when he says that during the height of the last ice age, around 20,000 years ago, the sea levels were 120 meters or 400 feet lower than they are now. Which also explains the footprints at White Sands in New Mexico, because the sea levels around the Bering Strait would have been lower around 25,000 to 23,000 years ago therefore exposing the land bridge and making it possible for people to get to North America. And the area known in modern times as Indonesia would have been part of the landmass known as Sundaland during this time, between 25,000 and 20,000 years ago at least. But, you know, at least. It existed way before as well. And back then, Doggerland in Europe was also still intact and thriving. For those who aren't aware, I created a mini documentary about Doggerland and how that landmass submerged on my channel last year. I will put that as a card in the upper right corner and I will place the link to that video in the description down below as well. According to Graham, during the Younger Dry School spell, a great deluge happened as sea levels rose drastically. But when I went to investigate this, I actually found that during the Younger Dryas, the rate of the sea level rise actually slowed down. It was before and after the Younger Dryas that the sea levels were rising more rapidly. Mostly before, though. Meltwater Pulse 1A around 14,000 years ago had sea levels increased between 16 to 24 meters until 12,000 years ago when the rate of the sea level rise slowed down at the start of the Younger Dryas. Meltwater Pulse 1B occurred between 11,600 and 11,000 years ago when sea levels may have risen by as much as 7.5 meters. Listening to this, this sounds like sea levels were rising rapidly and massively and, you know, it, it sounds very drastically. But knowing that the sea levels 20,000 years ago were 120 meters lower than today, they only rose about 10 meters until 15,000 years ago. Then in 1,000 years, the sea rose 30 meters, which is quite fast during Meltwater Pulse A, which happened, you know, between 15,000 and 14,000 years ago. 
which means that sea levels were around 80 meters lower than today before Meltwater Pulse 1A happened, and sea levels rose some 20 meters on average after this. So around the end of the Younger Dries, 3,000 years later, sea levels were only 60 meters lower than today. Which means that between 14,000 years ago and 11,000 years ago, the sea level had risen 20 meters. 20 meters in 3,000 years, while between 15,000 and 14,000 years ago, sea levels rose 30 meters in just 1,000 years much more drastically. It then takes another 3,000 years for the sea to rise 50 meters, making it 10 meters lower than today, around, you know, 8,000 years ago. This last rising of the sea levels happened double as fast compared to before and during the Younger Dryas. As you can see, the rising of the sea levels didn't happen overnight. During Meltwater Pulse 1A, the sea levels rose the fastest, with 30 meters in only 1,000 years. But okay, back to the show. Graham says that the way archaeology works is that there's going to continue to be a huge resistance to new evidence, which is problematic because science should always be open to new evidence. I can personally say that this is a very strange claim for him to make. Archaeologists are very much open to new ideas and new ways of thinking. And if there is actual evidence to support this, they will absolutely take this seriously. What I know that they don't do is take a claim without substantiated evidence as fact. And archaeologists often don't get funded for excavations, so they aren't even in the position to research certain things. Unless we are going to start funding them for projects like the ones Graham Hancock wants to have researched, they will most likely have to continue their current work on certain sites. The work, you know, that they are paid to do. Their workload is heavy, the work environment and conditions are very rough, and often they have to leave their homes and family behind for weeks on end during excavation season. So yeah, I think that if Graham wants sites like these to be excavated and researched, he can, you know, start a GoFundMe or something. Let's see how quickly he gets the funds to get a team of licensed archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists and scientists to research it so we can get some real answers. I mean, I honestly believe he is popular enough to get this funding done within, what, a few days probably. So yeah. <laughs> Start a GoFundMe, Graham. I want to see this. I am interested. And I'm not saying that it's impossible. I just want to see the actual research done. So this has been my response to the very first episode of the Ancient Apocalypse series. I've tried to keep the information as clear and concise as possible, and I've tried to remain fair towards Graham Hancock, who I think is piquing the interest of many people and hopefully making them more intrigued to learn more about the ancient world. But with that said, you have reached the end of this video. Next week, I'll be back with my response to episode two and, you know, a different video as well. We also have a cat. This is Lila. She likes to say hi from time to time. But with that said, if you enjoyed watching, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you'd like to see more of these kind of videos. And click that bell icon if you want to be notified whenever I upload. And maybe, you know, share this video with people you know have watched the show. Um, if you haven't seen my previous videos yet, then click the card in the upper right corner or click one of the links in the description down below. They go straight to my playlists. And you know the Doggerland video if you haven't seen it. And in the end card, you can also click either two playlists or a video. The video there is set to best for viewers, so YouTube caters to you and what it is that you'd like to see. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to all my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much for supporting me. It means the world to me. And if you're considering supporting me, then maybe become a channel member or a patron. And yeah, with that said, I'm going to cuddle my cat, watch some World Cup football and or soccer for my American viewers. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye, guys. Say bye, Laila. Bye.